Here we are, SkepTrack 2014. We've been doing this for about seven or eight years now. Yeah, believe it or that. When, you know, when we started, we had just one room at the back. There's four, this is four rooms. We used to have that one when we started way back there. Now we have four. Today we only need one because it's the first day. I already party last night, except you guys, which, you know, makes sense. Um, so what we're going to do, like we usually do on the kickoff, this is not anything formal. They're just the, these are going to be guests are going to do presentations and be on panels for the rest of the weekend. So they're just going to tell you a little bit about themselves. And we'll have an open mic at the end so you can ask some questions or everybody a question that's up here. It doesn't really matter. So we will start with the person at the very, very far end because he is a first time he guest here at DragonCon. And he'll be doing a magic show, I think, tomorrow night. No, no, Sunday, Sunday night. And uh, this is uh, Kurt Anderson. Hello. Uh, my name is Kurt Anderson. This is my first time on the Skeptic panel. I've been attending all seven years that you had it. Uh, my first Dragon Con was 1990. Uh, my wife and I in the second row there, uh, we actually worked with, and I was a DM for the first wor world's first ever $5,000 cash prize, Dungeons and Dragon contest that was here. 10,000? That's Geek. how old we are. And that was here at Dragon Con in 91. So uh, we've been around a while and it's just really cool to see Dragon Con take place every year and to have something like this and have a panel like this to uh, to get us to thinking. Hey, I didn't, really, didn't realize that you had that much cred. I, I made all of that up. Oh, see, the illusion is you can't trust them. Never. And then we have uh, a second time guest. His first year was last year. And uh, he's from England, actually from here, but he's been in England. And he's, they're trying to move him to Japan. And it's Nick, tell people a little bit about yourself. He, is, he has a very interesting background. Yeah, I'm not sure I can compare in that sense. My daughter's in the crowd going, why can't you have a cool job like that? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, Nick F. Timiotis. I, I am with the Department of Defense. That wasn't mine, I swear. <laughs> my crotch is, my crotch is beeping. <laughs> Big brother. <laughs> um, and uh, so I'll, I'll go. For it was a novellus. <laughs> for those who join me throughout the, uh, at any points during the weekend, I'll be um, uh, prefacing my remarks with, you know, this is my opinion, not that of your government. But uh, I did the, just get done with a three and a half year tour in uh, England, and we are headed out to Tokyo, if, uh, depending on how things work. Um, I have specialized in space and futures over the past uh, 15 years or so. I did seven years in the National Security Space Office, uh, leading teams to do generation after next uh, technology and space architectures. I've had a total of 30 years in the government. Some of them have been diplomatic assignments. Some of them in space and future technologies planning assignments. So on the side, I've done a fair amount of writing, fiction and nonfiction. And uh, I've been lucky in the fact that a lot of exposure to very, very advanced technology, which I sort of think about off into the future and implications for humanity and uh, the social institutions that we all know and are a part of. And uh, so that's incorporated in a lot of my writing. So when are the robots going to rise up like the Terminator and kill us all? Actually, the, the, you know, we, we, we're tapping them down now a bit, you know. <laughs> <laughs> guest here at Dragon Con and Skeptic Track is Todd. Hi, I'm Todd Stiefel. Can you hear me all right? So, so I'm Todd Stiefel. I am a Dragon Con virgin. Lifelong. Uh, I, I never, you never been here once before? I, never I thought been you here had. Before. No. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so yeah, I'm excited to be here. This has been, I've been in town 12 hours and having a lot of fun. Glad to be here, excited. Uh, I guess I'm on this panel because I've kind of got an unusual background. I spent my business career in pharmaceuticals, which was very science and research based, and now spend my time as a civil equality activist, basically working to promote reason and critical thinking uh, in a couple of key areas that I see as 
specifically important for humanity. One, the global threat of lack of critical thinking that leads to terrorism. Uh, two, the lack of critical thinking that leads to attacks on our civil liberties, such as anti-LGBT movements, uh, anti-contraception movements, etc. And then just discrimination in general, because ultimately that is rooted in ignorance and lack of critical thinking and skepticism as well. So. And everybody should know the next guy. He's been here since before we actually had this track. <laughs> I, 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 I bullied this guy to come to Dragon Con to like be on panels before I even had the skeptic track. We were still doing just the podcasting track. And it's Ben Radford. Hello, all. Yes, I uh, thank you for that. That introduction makes me feel very old. Um, yes, I, um, my name is Benjamin Radford. I'm the. Oh, that feels. So <laughs> little little Ferengi DS9 thing. Like, oh. Uh, yes, there you go. Um, uh, so, yeah, I, I do a variety of things. I'm probably best known for my uh, research investigations. I've written seven books. Uh, my most recent one is called Mysterious New Mexico. It's a, a collection of 13 uh, case study investigations in my home state of New Mexico. Uh, I'm a writer for Discovery News and LifeScience.com. I'm deputy editor of Skeptical Inquirer Science Magazine. I'm a research fellow for, uh, the, for the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry. Um, and I'm probably best known among the sort of um, cryptozoology fields for uh, researching and solving the case of the Chupacabra the vampire beast in fact, fiction and folklore. Uh, I do a lot of research into strange mysteries, everything ranging from ghosts to uh, alternative medicine, uh, this and that. I'll be giving a talk later today on crystal skulls and one on Sunday on uh, organ theft urban legends, including the ones, you know, where they say, oh my God, your kidney's still in call 911, and then you have to go and trace, trace your kidney to black markets in Asia and all sorts of fun things like that. <laughs> Well, come find out. It'll be fun. Come back and find out. Um, so anyway, that's, that's sort of what I do. And as, as Derek noted, uh, I've, one of the reasons I enjoy coming to Dragon Con is it, it's, a good, it's a good nexus for, uh, for communicating skepticism to the public. Uh, a lot of what I try to do from, with my columns and writings is to sort of say, hey, this is cool, this is interesting, here's this inherently fascinating topic, and here's how we look at it through science and critical thinking. Uh, and one of the cool things about Dragon Con is you have people who just wander by. They know nothing about the skeptics. They're, they're here for Star Trek. They're here to see William Shatner or whatever else. And they're like, hey, what's, what's that guy talking about in there? And they stop in, and, and Margaret knows the same thing. Like, oh, my God. And suddenly we have people who are like, they, they were never self-identified skeptics until they realized that there's people who actually do this. So that's, that's one reason that, that I'm here, and, and thank you all for being here. And last but not least... Margaret Downey, who's probably going to try to bull you into like being involved with something, because that's what she does. <laughs> she does it very well bully, too. Bully. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm uh, I'm a good organizer, as Derek has discovered um, from the very first Dragon Con that I was invited to as the Frigatrisca decophobia treatment nurse, and uh, that was seven years ago, and um, I am not the type of person that says, you know, Derek, you should do this without being ready to do that job. Um, so when I said, you know, where are the skeptics in the parade? Um, Derek says, well, you know, nobody's ever organized it. So I said, okay, I'll do it. And that was about three years ago. So um, I will have a presentation tomorrow at 11.30 to go over kind of the story behind uh, how the parade skeptic entry happened with a nice slideshow. You'll get to see some of the costumes we've come up with over the years. So please uh, arrive here at this room at 11.30 tomorrow after the parade. And all the parade participants will be here too. And you'll be able to see live and in person what you might miss tomorrow. The parade um, last year was viewed by 80,000 people. And this is a PR opportunity that the skeptics should never miss. Um, I also want to just tell you briefly that I have my own 501c3. It's uh, the Free Thoughts Society. Uh, and I also act as a goodwill representative between groups. I sit on the board of the Freedom From Religion Foundation. I do events for the Center for Inquiry. I speak for the American Humanist Association and was a past board member for them. And I also speak at American atheist conferences. 
Uh, and I'm very happy to announce that in a couple of weeks I'll be at ApostaCon uh, doing a workshop. And if uh, you're going to ApostaCon, please say hi. Uh, I'll be doing a workshop on Friday morning um, before Neil deGrace Tyson uh, speaks that night. And also going to ApostaCon is Lawrence Krauss. So uh, it, it's going to be a great event in Omaha, Nebraska. If you have an opportunity to sign up, um, please do so. And use my speaker code, MDOW1466. Thanks. <laughs> I told you she's going to make you do something. <laughs> All right. So I found, I got, I got a message from the novella. Um, they were still at the airport when this started. So uh, they, by the time they get here, this might be over. Um, so that's what happened with him. So he didn't shun us or anything. So we have a microphone that's right there in the center of the aisle of the middle of the room. And if you have questions, you should probably line up on that microphone. And uh, there's a, a fun song that goes along with, you know, what, we, what we're going to do from now on with our uh, QA. And I got this from George Rabb, who has been back for a couple of years, but it's still George Rabb and he's funny. So uh, you got that for me? There may be time at the end of a talk For an audience question or maybe two If you've the desire to try and inquire There's just one thing that I ask of you I said it last year, I'm saying it again Make sure that your question's a question A story, a yarn, or a tale It should have a point and be nice and concise Or else I'll throw you in question jail I'm sure that your story's quite special I'm sure that your view is unique But folks have paid big bucks to hear expertise And not watch time run out while you speak Make sure that your question's a question <laughs> Make sure that it doesn't run long And if it turns into a diatribe We all will start singing this song So I'm all for a well thought out question But brevity is what we need When figuring out what you're going to ask Think less blog and more Twitter feed. Make sure that your question's a question. It should be like a one sentence quiz. The phrase that it absolutely can't contain starts with quote My opinion is. I have a feeling I'll have to play that more than once this weekend. <laughs> And you know, this is one of the reasons why I hate the fact that he's not at DragonCon for the past couple of years. I can, there's a reason for that. He got a, there's a new manager of his orchestra, and they used to never play Labor Day weekends, but they do now. So, and he's the drummer, so you can't have a band without a drummer. So he's here, so he, gave, he said, you can play this. I was like, okay. <laughs> All right, so obviously because we played that song, there's nobody wants to tell, ask a question because they had stories. Everybody was really wordy. So we will then start at the end with uh, Kurt. Kurt. Yes. So you do magic. I do. Is it magic or illusions? Uh, it is illusions. I, I tell people in the show, I ask people at the start of the show regularly, do you know the difference between a magician and an illusionist? And I ask this all over the country, and no one ever gets it right. And I'll tell them you're not going to get it right, and they'll have various answers. And I'll say, the difference between a magician and an illusionist is how much you pay for him. <laughs> if I make a quarter disappear, people go, oh, that was a cute magic trick. Earlier this year, we made a $250,000 Ferrari and set a world record for the fastest car vanish. They said that was an incredible illusion because it sounds cooler. <laughs> so, unfortunately, too often I'm a magician, but I'm trying to be an illusionist more regularly. <laughs> so I didn't, I, I forgot to ask you, so did you actually get the record? It's, it's pending. That's a very difficult process. That's almost as hard as getting on a panel at Dragon Con. <laughs> um, it, they're very, very strict. Uh, a lot of paperwork, a lot of, we had to have three judges, and they have no reason to take, uh, you know, to go quickly. 
So what Guinness did is they decided that, you know, you can wait up to a year to find out if your record is verified or you could pay $600 and get it within a month. Oh, it's like a walk of the fame star. So I said, you know what? You just let me know. Yeah. Now, they did unofficially tell me it's the fastest they'd ever seen, but there's, you know, a lot of work. We made, uh, we made the car vanish in under five seconds, and in one of our rehearsal tries, we did uh, 2.7. Well, then what was, what, why are you slacking on the, on the real one? Being careful that uh, I didn't expose it in front of a crowd of thousands. <laughs> so. Doesn't it also cost to get the judge to go to your event? Don't you have to put money up front to... Yeah, they, they, they've got several ways to do that. They, they do offer an alternative if you apply for the uh, record ahead of time and provide three judges that they pre-approve. Pre and then they each have to have their own written statement. Uh, we had to have it timed. We had to have it videoed and time-coded. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Bunch of stuff. I, yep. I'd be fascinated to see the, the slowest. The slowest? <laughs> like, how slowly can you make this car I, I'm disappear? I'm shooting for that, too. I started back in 88. I'm not done yet. <laughs> Is that anything like when you go to the air shows and they try to like show off how slow their big jet right. can go? Yeah, yeah. Like the bumper. Wait, kids. Oh, the, the wheel. Okay, slow down. All right, all right. Or driver's seat now. Yeah, I could just, I could just figure this. Actually, the biggest challenge with this is they said, well, we can't verify. We can't even let you do this because you're, the, I originally applied to have the world's fastest car vanish. And they said, so you have to prove to us that it's right. not on the earth anymore that you actually made it disappear. I said, well, that's ridiculous. We don't really. <laughs> <laughs> hey, at least they are critical about that. It's magic. And I said, well, then, then you're asking us to approve something that's not possible. So I actually had to sit down with a guy that worked for Guinness, and the official title is the world's fastest stationary car vanish illusion before a live audience. That way, you can't say, well, you know, Brian Brushwood took a video camera and had a car in his driveway and then stopped it move the car, turn it back on, and now he's got a, you know, one frame car vanish. So uh, it had to be before a live audience and the whole thing. But uh, then I had to write an, uh, an alternative title so that if it gets published in the book, uh, which like less than 1% of records actually make it into the actual published Guinness Book of World Records, that they would have a shorter title that would be catchier to people's eye. So... You know, all these car manufacturers always, you know, boast, um, our car goes from zero to 60 in a minute. What I want is a car that goes from 60 to zero so that I won't get ticketed when I see a cop. <laughs> that tells me a lot about your driving. <laughs> you know, it's funny, I, I was wondering about that because uh, I don't know how many people of you, how many of you have been coming to Dragon for a while, but I remember back, I think it was the year that Michael Jackson died we set the record for the number of people actually in costume performing the thrill, Thriller video. Right. And we did actually beat it by quite a bit, but we got it taken away because of a technicality because another group did it, but they didn't dress up, they didn't dance or anything. But they just had a big crowd, oh. and it was in Japan somewhere. Oh. And we're like, what? It was, so, yeah, that's, that, that's the thing about these world record stuff. It's a little... Shady sometimes. You didn't pay enough. Yeah, right. Probably. Yeah, it was a big deal. Like it was like everybody dressed and they actually did the exact thing. They even they even had somebody dressed as Michael Jackson and did his part in everything. And no, some big crowd is listening to the song in, in Japan and they, they won the world record. It's like how many asterisks can you put on the record? Yeah. You still yeah. have it for in costume. Yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. I guess we I guess we didn't write like he said. I don't think we wrote out what our title was long enough to like be in that one pigeonhole. So I was wondering if you actually got that or not. Uh, so I'll, let, I'll let you know when I'm on panel next year. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, Nick, when are the robots going to rise up and kill us? Well, oh, look, we have a question. Oh, yeah, we do. Question. Here we go. <laughs> All right. Okay, let's have something really vague. When does religion end and philosophy begin? Or where? And, uh, well, are there any of those religions out there that don't tell you that uh, you're going to go, you know, bad things will happen to you if you don't follow them? So, a couple of those, really vague ones. Well, I know at least one. So, I, I, 
personally, I don't think religion's going anywhere anytime soon. As a matter of fact, this is an example, and this was surprising me. I was actually in Greece last month, and we did a tour of the Acropolis, and we had our tour guide who was very well educated. He's a former archaeologist who then went back to school for three years to be a tour guide. And knew his stuff backwards and forwards, try around, learn all these interesting things. One of the things he told us is that there is still a small subset of the Greek population that worships Zeus and the full Greek pantheon. So we, we haven't killed them off yet. I, I don't think <laughs> religion's going anywhere anytime soon, unfortunately. I, I, think, uh, I, I think that it's going to decrease and the world's going to keep secularizing, but I think there is always going to be religion and religious people. My only hope is that it becomes more moderate and tolerant in time. Well, can I ask, are you talking about the distinction between religion as in and in, in, in afterlife and the belief therein and philosophy as in a way of human existence? Because those are two different, well, you know, there's overlap, but... Um, both, actually. Uh, the afterlife thing is, uh, to me, one of the most onerous parts of the religious sales pitch because it's almost, they, they say they love you, but they've got this threat. Well, but if you don't buy our stuff, you're going to burn in hell. Right. Uh, so uh, actually, if you could cover both. The other one is the philosophy. You know, this is how you should live, but there is no threat at the end of the at the end of the tagline. Of, See, I, I, I think if you look globally, I think you'll find that in certain regions in the world, religion is on the way up. Middle East being, you know, um, one of them, and the spread therein. Uh, philosophy, ways people should lead their, lead their lives, or philosophical constructs, if you will, on, on, on human behavior, uh, that's sort of a really interesting thing because, you know, the technology of the day, you know, the, the way I look at it has changed us dramatically now and for the next couple of decades is going to impact civilization, you know, in, in an extraordinary fashion. And you can see in some places, example, China, just this complete lack of sort of a, uh, a reason in, in living or a philosophical bent towards living, very particularly in their, in their exalted classes, for lack of a better term. You know, for those who are really making it in China, that small percent of the population that's actually uh, uh, benefiting tremendously, uh, they're sort of at a philosophical, you know, lacking, and, and they're really struggling to find something. So I think you have a lot of forces that are going to, I mean, America is still one of the most, believe it or not, as developed countries, it's about the most religious in the world, as developed nations go. So, um, uh, and I don't know sort of the state of that. Maybe, uh, I don't know if that's on the rise or, or decline or what. Typically, when other segments of society... Going down. A little, slowly going down. So, uh, all right, okay, but typically, you know, what I do worry about is other when you have sort of that explosive resistance, um, let's say in the Middle East, you know, in extremism, you get a reaction on the other side. That, that has me concerned personally. But um, so I, I don't know, it sort of depends. We have a somewhat of a hodgepodge of, of philosophical and, and religious beliefs that are going to change and expand dramatically as, as the next decades unfold. I'll just quickly add that uh, from my position uh, as, as a skeptical researcher, investigator, I have no particular opinion on that, and here's why, uh, which, which is not a comment. I have no opinion, and let me tell you why I have no opinion about that. <laughs> but uh, because but, I occasionally get questions about, uh, you know, dealing with religion and belief in the afterlife. And what happens is that you know, if someone comes up to me and says that they believe in God, or they believe that the angels are talking to them, my answer is, great. Good for you. That's that's wonderful. I'm 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 glad you get comfort in that. Uh, I I have no particular opinion on that. People want to believe in God. People want to believe whatever they want. The the issue comes in that if they're making testable claims based upon that. So if someone says I believe in God because last week uh, my mother was praying and she was suddenly cured, uh, and this is this is God's work. Well, that's a testable claim, and that's the point where I say, okay, you're you've now made a, a positive claim. We can test that. We can look into that. If someone says, I believe uh, that you know, in angels because you know, there was some miracle or you know, there's a statue of weeping tears or whatever else, again, that's a testable claim. And then that's where you get into, for example, claims about the afterlife, claims about ghosts, uh, reincarnation. Again, these are all claims that, that are particularly ghosts and reincarnation because they, they involve you know, theology and afterlife and religion. But again, I don't, if someone just says that they believe in those sorts of things, I, that, that's great. Um, I have no opinion on that. You can believe whatever you want. 
if you make a claim that's a testable claim that, uh, uh, that can be empirically uh, proven one way or the other by science, that's where I'll come into it and say, okay, what exactly is your evidence? And, and I'd like to quote Yates when I'm approached with this particular question. Philosophy can clip an angel's wings. And that means that, you know, as if, if philosophy becomes more popular, uh, in, in other words, living your life to the fullest, and this is how you can do that, as long as there is fear of death, there will be religion. There will be something to give hope to those who fear death. Um, philosophy can cure that. It, it can provide um, an afterlife in a way in that what philosophy can do is say, look, you know, your legacy is your afterlife. Now, live your life in a way that people will be proud to have known you, will talk about you after you're, de after you're dead. Um, so I really see where philosophy can benefit rational thinking, critical thinking, but religion will always be alive as long as there's fear of death. And the other question that you had about is there any re religions, quote unquote, that don't deal with the threat of an afterlife? Uh, a lot of Judaism is like that. A lot, there's actually many atheist rabbis, and people don't know that or don't, don't realize that. Um, the Torah, Torah doesn't have anything to do with afterlife or ghosts or anything like that. There's no punishment or hell. So there is at least one, and people don't realize it, I think. A lot of people don't know that. But. Uh oh. Angie. Thank you. Um, I always love seeing when we have people who are well, well, um, um, who are ch have hot. God, I need more coffee. Um, <laughs> um, coffee stuff. Well, I know, right? So um, I love it when people who have made some contributions are in front of people who may or may not have had an opportunity. So I wonder if each of you would talk a little bit about your um, most proud moments in skepticism or um, in your career thus far, even if it's something as simple as I learned how to tie my shoe or something, I don't know, anything <laughs> like that. And then what regrets do you have? And what, um, what has your, been your biggest frustration? Mark says we have like 30 minutes left, so go ahead. <laughs> Drag it up. <laughs> Great. Drag it up. Play the song again. <laughs> we'll start at the end. All right, well, this, you know, this will make sense to some and maybe not to others, but I think the, the most proud for me is, is actually on a personal level. Uh, my wife and I have three sons, and to see them learn to think for themselves uh, means more to me than anybody that I speak to, anybody that I perform for. Um, somebody comes to my show or somebody comes to hear me speak and I don't know what they take from that. Every one of you have a different life, a different experience and you walk away from this weekend with something different but I get to see it with my boys and, and it, it impacts every area of life. You know, to have one son go, you know that TV ad doesn't make sense because you know, and to be able to distinguish when they're just trying to sell a product that's maybe crap, or another case where, you know what, it is worth paying extra for this because it's a better item. And those, those things seem simple a lot of times, but to be able to distinguish the difference when you're 10, 11, 12 years old, to me, I marvel at that. Um, I, one of my sons came in one day, he said, Dad, I have a question. I said, okay. And he's six, was he, Drew six? Five or six? <laughs> right? He's 12 now. <laughs> Take notes. Always ask the wife. Look, I even know my anniversary, okay? So he, five or six years old, he said, I want to ask you something. I said, what's that? He goes, the tooth fairy can't be real. I said, well, why do you say that? He said, because he'd have to come to my room every night. And I wake up at least half the nights. By random chance, I would have had to have seen him at some point. I'm like, would it disappoint you to find out the tooth fairy is not real? He goes, would I still get the money? <laughs> I said, yes. I said, if the tooth fairy is not real, it's a game that we play. And as long as you play the game, regardless if you believe it's real or not, you still get the money. He goes, I have no problem with that. <laughs> so about 30 minutes later, he's in his room and I'm watching TV and he's like, oh crap. I went in there, so what's wrong? He goes, Santa and the Easter Bunny. 
<laughs> I'm like, you can still play. He goes, okay. So, you so know. I accept that, your conditions, right? That's, that's <laughs> going on in his head. My kids think like that all the time. And to me, that's my p proudest accomplishment, really, is to see them develop. And they're going to do far greater things than anything I've ever done in my life. So, back to legacy. Frustration? That have to be kids again. <laughs> um, oh crap! Yeah. Uh, the, the frustration is uh, again. There's there's so many different people. There's so many different beliefs and philosophies and ideas, and people say they want to discuss it and they don't. Um, you know, as a magician, we've had people say, "Well, we're not going to have you because there's people in our area who think what you do is demonic." And I was like, "Okay, well, I'd like to talk to those people." And I've had times where I would say, well, schedule a time for me to talk to them, and they, they won't talk to me. And I said, well, here's the problem I have. If what I do is demonic and it's wrong, it's not that I shouldn't do it for your area. I shouldn't do it anywhere. So let's get together, and I should either be able to explain to you what I do and why, and it's okay, or you should be able to explain to me why what I do is wrong, and I should stop. It shouldn't be I can't do that here. I can do it everywhere else. That's, that's a frustration for me. And it comes with what I do because I'm weird. So, you also took over um, half of uh, Brushwood's old hairstyle. What's that? You took over half of Brushwood's old well, hairstyle. I had this before he was born. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I had that before either you were born. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's funny because I, uh, well, on my original schedule, they had to, it fell off fell through, but we were going to have the premiere of The Honest Liar, which is a documentary about James Randi, which I've seen. And it deals exactly with what he's talking about, really. It's about, well, illusionists and magicians, and they basically are liars, but everybody knows it. So is that okay, or being honest? And there's a, there's a whole part of it that's all about that. It's like, well, you're, you're fooling people, and what do you do with that? I mean, is the morality of that. So, And we have Todd Diefel. Tell us all about pharmaceuticals. Uh, we skipped Nick here. Oh, Nick, did I forget you? <laughs> Apparently, I'm a forgetful well, well, type. Uh, he's, I think he started, and then Nick, we got. Well, maybe, kinda, maybe, I, well, well, maybe I was. Maybe I'm just uh, protecting your top secret clearance. You know what? It, it just it flashed through my mind. Wow, that was really cool. <laughs> <laughs> Blame him. <laughs> <laughs> but I think I can make one comment if if that's okay. Um, first off, I'll, I'll join you in. Um, in my accomplishment of raising six kids. And, uh, six? Yeah. And, Are you uh, an ex-Mormon? <laughs> no, and if I ever figure out what causes this, I'm going to just... Uh, <laughs> you know there's a procedure for that. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, I know it. Uh, and, no, and, uh, and five of them being daughters, you know, the, there's the frustration part in the answer to your question. How many uh, bathrooms do you have? <laughs> not enough, no matter what the... Uh, nor closet space. Uh, but I, I will tell you that um, I have done, I guess, some of the writings that I've done actually on the outside. Uh, I did a book on China, specifically on Chinese intelligence in the mid-90s, and which wound up in congressional hearings and testimony and... C-SPAN. Yes. You were on C-SPAN. Uh, ABC, NBC, CBS, you know, blah, blah, blah. But it was an analytical work. I mean, to me, it was a piece of scholarship, and that's the way I approached it. Okay, very, someone wrote on it in a review that this book is as dry as James Bond's vodka martini. However, <laughs> yeah, however, if you really want to know about the line and block, because that's the way an analyst writes. I mean, that's the way you write and you think, and, and as critical thinking goes, you question everything and get multiple sources on it, and any specific point that you're making, uh, in fact, they probably took out two-thirds of the footnotes on my book because, you know, I did it to get it past the clearance people, but of course the publisher said, you know, this is unreadable, one sentence with four footnotes to it. So, uh, but every time you make an assertion, you know, in that, in that sense it goes behind. So, but the impact of that and several of the written works that, that I've had, which I've, I've actually gotten to see that has resulted in legislation, that has resulted in change in, um, in the way operations, government operates as a, as a whole sort of things in society, that's a great, I mean, to me, a great accomplishment. You've actually done your work and, and, and watched that change. And I will say for all those people in my career field, um, and, uh, you know, just to be frank and honest with you, a lot of them do things and write things that make extraordinary change that impacts everyday life. I mean, it really does. And, uh, and you'll never know about it. I mean, it just, they, so, and in, in maybe that's their level of frustration. 
you know, because you, you do things like that and you do write, you know, pieces that policymakers look at and they say, wow, we need to do this or we need to change a multi-billion dollar, you know, satellite system or something like that. That type of stuff happens all the time. And I mean all the time. But, uh, you know, and, and people serve in silence. So I, I don't know if there's a level of frustration. I'm not sure of me. I'm sort of over 30 years now, so I'm over it. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, all right. Come on, next, next. And meanwhile, what's that check say at the end of the day? <laughs> so that's sort of where you, I guess, you end up. But, uh, but so in, in that world, there's been some triumphs and some really good feelings, even in particular my writings. And then, you know, of course, some levels of frustration that come along with it. Stupid people is a, is a frustration. I mean, <laughs> I, you know, I, uh, let me tell you something. Uh, and probably shouldn't be saying this, but uh, in, in your government. I mean, there are some extraordinarily brilliant people. I really, really mean it, critical thinking, as critical thinkers go. And you know what? Three and a half years in the UK and liaison to Europe, uh, you know, in some senses, I think as a society, we, own a, we have a tough time we're holding a candle to the Brits. Really incredible critical thinkers. I mean, it's just, yeah, if you're ever going to get in a discussion and a debate and an argument you know, with, with, with someone in the UK who's in a specific field subject, know your material because it will slice you up in, in you know, even on US politics, they, 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 well, wait a minute, didn't Obama say in, you know, 2011 that, how the hell do you remember that? How do you know? I mean, just, they really like that. Very, very keen intellectual thinkers. Um, but, you know, uh, unfortunately, as far as the, the world goes, you know, one person making dumb decisions, or just one, I mean, and I've watched this, destroy the work of hundreds. I mean, just, no, 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 we don't want to do that. This is the direction we're going to go. Really? You just had like 800 people working for a year and a half on that. And, and you know, and you're switching that, you know, honestly. And, and that, that happens. That happens, too, all the time. Sometimes I don't know how we make it. Because there's a, you know, no, really, and I'm sure it happens worldwide. I'm sure it's nothing new, and I'm sure you get it in IBM and every place else. But um, but it, it's interesting. So frustration is is sort of that, you know, great thinkers, but it only takes a few that aren't so great to sort of, um, you know, get, give you the impression that things aren't working as well as they should. Well, a perfect example: the, somebody making a stupid decision. We had almost, we would have had the most powerful, way more powerful than the thing in CERN collider here in Texas. It was bigger. It was almost done. And at the last budget hearing, they had a scientist who made the mistake of saying, well, they asked him, well, what is this thing going to do? So what we were looking for the God particle. And all everybody in the, in the budget office said, nah. Because that sounds dumb. It doesn't work. It's not worth it. So shut it down. I used to work for the guy who was said, say, if God wanted you to find that particle, yeah. he'd have shown it to no, you. They, they, that was the reason why. And they have the science Jeez. behind them, but they, they, they made one mistake. And I worked for the guy who was the IT project manager for that, that thing. And so I heard so many stories about why they have one uncritical thinking person, government, who said that to the budget office. And they said, OK, we'll just strike that. And we would have been done a long time ago. And it, the, the tunnel's still, still there underground, but it's rotting, but, you know, it's still there. All right, Todd, now it's your turn. So, gosh, proudest moment. I, I'm going to cheat and give you two, because the first one's kind of, isn't as interesting in the crowd. The other one's kind of funny. So, the, the, just in my in terms of my career as an activist, I'd say getting to speak at the Reason Rally in 2012. I, were any of you at the Reason Rally? Uh, it was... Uh, Wonderful day, and I had a long 20-minute slot, and I couldn't even tell you how many hours I spent prepping. I went and studied the I, I Have a Dream speech and watched it again and again and read write-ups on how he did it and what different things he used. And so that was just a, a wonderful moment. But a more, more interesting one, kind of back to the kid theme, is uh, reading the Bible, uh, children's Bible, to my kids. And they were pro my son was probably about six at the time as well and we're going through we're doing the Noah's Ark story and we get to the end of the story and, and God's you know really happy with Noah at this point he's like and you know as a reward for your wonderful service saving everything you know, now I'm gonna give you rainbows aren't they awesome and and from now on day will follow night will follow day will follow night no more of this like constant rain stuff and my son just stops he's like that's not true. I have evidence. And he grabs the Bible from me and starts flipping back. And he goes all the way back to the beginning of Genesis. He's like, look, right here. 
God created the sun and the moon right here at the beginning. He created the earth. No, 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 no. Day already <laughs> follows night because we already have these planetary bodies. He can't do that twice. That's not a reward. I was like, way to go, son. I hadn't even picked up on that one. I've been hanging out with atheists a long time, and nobody's mentioned the day follow night one, so good work. Uh, d disappointments or frustrations in the line of work of working with working against intolerance and, and trying to eliminate discrimination it, it can it can wear on you sometimes and you hear stories of lots and lots of people getting death threats and you know, I just heard of a story of a six-year-old uh, girl who was physically beaten up twice for because somebody asked her if she believed in God she said no and the kid immediately started punching her um, <laughs> Stuff like that. <laughs> it, 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 does someone ever point out the logic inconsistency it, there? It, it, it's like <laughs> stu oh, oh. stuff like that's pretty frustrating to hear those kind of stories day in, day out. Uh, but I, I've, I've asked advice on how to deal with that, and one of the best advice came from Rob Boston, who said, "Just to when when you get down about these kind of things, look at the victories. Look at how much progress is being made. How many, you know, how how much." legitimate data points from Pew and Gallup show tolerance is increasing and, and things are going in the right direction, even though there's still a lot of horrible things happening. Man. Yeah, I, I, I think back to <clears throat> Pinker's new book, the, the Better Angels of Our Nature, oh, that, yeah. that talks a lot Good about book. that and, you know, that religion is decreasing and violence is, is decreasing and things like that as well. Um, you know, I, I was uh, sort of, my experience sort of resonated with yours in that, um, in that in my in my doing this for what 17 18 years now how long have we doing this uh, Jeez, me? too long I'm, I'm um, at me. <laughs> <laughs> i uh, you know I, I find that that success and skepticism is measured in small victories um, it's one of those things where it doesn't matter how many psychics are put in jail for scamming people there's five more right behind them doesn't matter how many infomercials are taken off the air because they're bullshit 20 more waiting right behind it um, and uh, just on and on and on. It doesn't matter how many UFO cases or Bigfoot cases you debunk, there's, there's another one right behind it. And so the, the analogy, I think it was Al Sprague de Camp talked about how that a lot of the work of skepticism is essentially sort of taking out the garbage, is that, is that every day there's more garbage there, and you don't notice it because, because the garbage gets taken away magically by, by men in sanitation trucks. But but that, that that's that's a lot of what we do. We're 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 sort of you know, garbage men, and you, you you try and clear out the the bad stuff and weed out the bad ideas and misinformation. But there's still more the next day, and not to get frustrated because if you didn't take it out, there'd be more and more each time. Um, and so that's sort of that's sort of some of the, my my experience with that. In terms of the the, the proudest moments, there there's two. I'll share two of them real quickly. One of them was. Um, uh, my 2010 book, Tracking the Chupacabra, because it's about the vampire beast, and some of you may know it, some of you not, I'll be happy to talk about it later. But it, it's a worldwide known, sort of actually the second best known creature after, after Bigfoot. And it's known all the world and did a bunch of research on it. And the reason I'm especially proud of that book is that uh, it's a very scholarly book, and it was actually well received in academic circles. Uh, it was written up in folklore journals and anthropology journals. For which, give, given, the, given that most of the books out there about Loch Ness Monster and Bigfoot, it's all this sort of like, you know, sort of superficial stuff that has no scholarship to it whatsoever. And here, the, the academic circle said, wow, this guy did his research, and this is, this is kind of cool. And, and so that was kind of nice to, get, to not only get uh, recognition among skeptics, but also among scholars who said, yeah, this is, you know, he did a good job on that. So I'm, I'm proud of that. And the second one would be, probably be a case... Um, uh, it, was a, it was a haunted house investigation I did in Buffalo uh, about 12 years ago. And uh, I won't go into the whole story. There's a chapter in one of my books about it. But basically, I was called in. I was living in Buffalo at the time. And it, was, uh, it was a married couple, and they had a young daughter. And they, they became convinced their house was haunted. And they ser seriously believed the house was haunted. They were, they were scared. And they, uh, they left their house shortly after Halloween. And they contacted me and said, look, we don't know what to do. We believe there's a demonic, evil entity in our house. Can you help us? And I was like, well, I guess I need to clear the next week. All right. So um, they gave me this, this, sort of, this laundry list of, of typical haunted house stuff, everything from the cats were acting weird, there's a demonic photo, all sorts of stuff. And the reason they came to me is they had previously gone to uh, ghost hunters and psychics 
And the psychic told them, your house is haunted. So they went to a non-skeptical person, a, a, an expert, an authoritative person, who said, yes, your, your fears are correct. There's a demonic evil entity in your house. This, of course, made the problem much worse. They actually couldn't sleep in their own house at night. So it wasn't until they came to me, a skeptic, who actually took the time. I spent a week and a half researching this. I mean, it was, all, it was you know, free of charge. It was my own time. I did everything I could. I ended up solving the case. And they were in, ended up being back in their, in their home in time for Thanksgiving. But I'm especially proud of that because it's a case where, where I was actually helping real people. This wasn't some sort of abstract, oh, well, this, this UFO, you know, this, this photo's this, this, you know, this one's fake, this is that. These are real people who needed real actual help. And, and because they came to a skeptic, it could have been somebody else, they just happened to come to me, I was able to allay their fears and, and help them out. And, and, you know, they went back in their house and the, 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 uh, the, the, their young girl was, was, uh, was, you know, everything was fine after that. So I, I'm proud of that case because, again, it was real life people who needed help. They'd been, been misled by their interpretation and the psychology of all this and also by bullshit psychics and ghost hunters who, who misinformed them and actually made the situation worse. Um, and anyway, I, I talked a little bit about the frustrations part at the beginning, so that's, that's mine. Oh, that was great, Ben. Um, I guess I should start with frustrations because um, it's always the same frustration with me, and it's always lack of money and lack of help um, because my mind is filled with ideas and projects and creative thinking but um, I have to go and kind of market these things out. So that leads me to the thing I'm most proud of, which is creating the anti-discrimination support network for the non-theist community. And uh, back in 1991, I established a method for recording uh, discrimination cases uh, with the non-theists around the country. And that led to me getting invited to the United Nations Freedom of Religion or Belief Committee, where I, um, I made reports every five years. But because I don't have staff, because I don't have money, um, I just recently asked the Secular Coalition for America to adopt the program since they have staff and they have money. <laughs> so I was very, very proud that they liked the project and they're going forth with it in a, a much better way than I could um, because they're now you know, online forms that you can fill out and they get into a database right away. Uh, we also have pro bono attorneys willing to talk to people who've been discriminated against. And uh, you know, we're connecting people all over the country who have similar situations. So I'm very proud of that particular project. Um, but um, one of the projects that I'm hoping will really take off is my mentoring of younger generations of non-theist and skeptics. I think it's very important that we all get out there and get younger people to tell us their journey stories, to develop speaking abilities, to give them a venue in which to become an activist. And so I'm traveling around the country recently just uh, showing people how important it is to write a journey story because that can also be a, a book pitch. So, you know, journey stories connect us emotionally. Um, a lot of non-theists have reasons why they don't believe God, like, show me the evidence, there's no evidence. Well, tell me your story and then connect emotionally with me and I'll listen. I think it's a better way to talk about the subject. So um, that would be one of the things that um, I'm doing recently, but maybe the worst thing that's happened um, would probably be death threats. You know, there's, there's nothing more scary than a death threat. Um, I felt so terrible getting a death threat one time and hadn't had the time to tell my son or my husband that I had a death threat and they came home and found the police there. And that was the worst experience. So <laughs> that would probably be the worst thing that happened. Um, and I started to regret speaking up and being an activist because of those death threats. But then that would be my worst regret is not speaking up. I have to be principled and I have to move forward when I see an injustice. So 
that's it. Just, <laughs> just as an aside, the, the story of the six-year-old girl who was beaten up, we would never have even learned about if it wasn't for the anti-discrimination uh, network and ability to get that in that Margaret set up, so. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> Next up. Oh, I thought somebody. Oh. Oh, well, um, actually, I was just wondering is there anybody out there agitating or advocating or encouraging people to say in the U.S. the Pledge of Allegiance in its original form without the under God part that was added? I had an uncle who always refused to say the under God part because. I, he remembered the way it was originally was before they snuck that in. So is there anybody out there advocating that people just in public settings yes. just say it without it? Yes. Um, we have a really big effort going on across the nation, started by Michael Newdow, who was the fellow who tried to get that taken out um, constitutionally through the Supreme Court. They threw his case out saying that he didn't have any standing to bring it forward, but they, he did get um, a hearing, an, or, an oral presentation at the Supreme Court level. He was magnificent, and even the justices all said what a great orator he was. So what he did was he started um, trying to find cases around the nation where children were forced in their school system to say the pledge with under God in it because it becomes a prayer at that point with those two words. And so we have several cases. He won his case in California um, that he presented on behalf of two families. We're trying to get a case won in every district in the United States so that when there is uh, a non-win, we can show the conflict and then take it to the Supreme Court again. But Michael Newdow, his um, website is First Amendment. Um, I think that's what it's called. But um, look it up. Michael Newdow's uh, 501c3, I think. Um, and you can help support that cause. How do you spell Newdow? Uh, Newdow. Uh, N E W D O W. Um, can, I, can I just throw a quick follow up in there? Yes. I've always sort of been confused as to why the battle isn't against the pledge in the first place. I mean, I understand the against God, but I think the I mean, I guess that's a question. Is there, is there a rationalization? But I mean, I know it's a We can't answer this question. Yeah. The question was why don't we just fight the pledge altogether? Um, and, you know, a lot of people have done that on behalf of their religion, that they shouldn't be forced to say a pledge because it's against their religion. But um, what we're trying to do is, is not force that issue, but get those two words out. Um, we also, in the process, are also saying it's, it's not fair to mandatorily demand a Pledge of Allegiance be said, that we have the right to sit out a pledge. Um, as even, you know, an atheist, it doesn't have to be a religion. We just don't want to say it. Whenever I go to a city council meeting and they say the pledge, I wait, uh, I say it very nicely, but just at the point where the rest of the audience says, under God, I always say, indivisible, <laughs> just as loud as I can. <laughs> Next. Uh, yes, as the saying goes, you're entitled to your own opinion, but not your own facts. Uh, what do you think about people who are trying to get new facts about like paranormal investigators, not necessarily debunkers, but like paranormal investigators or people trying to do psychic research? What do you think about their kind of efforts? Um, I think that in general, uh, you know, I, I don't have a problem with people trying to do research into anything, whether it's the subject of whether ghosts exist or uh, psychic powers, ESP, Bigfoot, whatever else. Uh, my issue is, if you're going to do it, then do it right. Uh, these are inherently fascinating subjects. Who doesn't love a good ghost story or, you know, Bigfoot, Chupacabra, psychic power? Who wouldn't love to think that these things are real? And so I think it's a mistake to, to and I've heard other skeptics sort of say, oh, well, this is all bullshit. We all know this isn't true, don't we? No, 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 we all don't know this isn't true. I promise you. <laughs> There's lots of people out there who really believe these things. Many of them vote. Think about that, all right? There's issues here. Uh, and and even, if, even if you can say, oh, well, some of this stuff is poo-pooed, it's all just, you know, if you want to believe in aliens, whatever else. Well, what if the subject is alternative medicine? 
What if you're? What if a family member of yours uh, thinks that uh, that you can you can cure any disease by simply eating raw food? I actually know a guy who, who believed that. Uh, when he got cancer, he changed his mind after a few weeks. Um, but but I mean, you know, again, there, there's there's serious serious issues there. So anyway, the answer to your question, I think, in my opinion, is that is that if people want to, because I because I you know I, I deal with people, I interview people who are you know Bigfoot believers and people who are making making a, a legitimate effort to bring some scholarship to these these areas of the paranormal and mysterious. And my answer is, great, I support you. I'm not laughing at you. I'm not making fun of you. I'm trying to help you do this better. I'm trying to help you bring skepticism and, and critical thinking and, not, and you know, scientific methodologies and, and, and these sorts of things into that. So, so my position is uh, these are fascinating subjects. If you want to research it, great, but don't waste your time if you're not going to do it with science because you're spinning your wheels. More facts is always good. Um, you, you said you, you, you're... You have your right to your opinion, but not your facts. Facts are good, but when you put the facts and the opinions together and come up with conclusions is more the problem, I think. Mm -hmm. um, the truth will always hold up on its own if, if you get enough facts. So even, you know, somebody looking for facts that there's ghosts, if they're looking to prove there's ghosts, that, that's great, like you said. Because if it's actually a fact, if you can actually prove there's ghosts, you know, uh, I think you talk to anybody in the skeptic field and say, is there anything 20 years ago you believe different than you do now? Everybody's going to say yes. If you're, if you're learning, um, more facts is always good. Yeah, Even sure. if someone's looking for a fact you don't believe they're going to find. Yeah. Well, maybe they won't and we were right. Maybe they will and then we have to change our mind. That's okay. Yeah. I have no problem You don't know that. if you don't look. Last question. Derek, for letting me in. Uh, so many of you refer to your own children and the influence that you've had, and yet as an educational consultant, I often see that our school teachers don't know what critical thinking is. They've made other definitions for it. How do you think that the skeptic community can influence that? That's a really good question. <laughs> Actually, I, 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 I um, I, I, you know, I left that out in the discussion because I do, or at least up until recently, taught uh, the graduate program at King's College in London, and, and sort of one of the, at least for me personally, one of the best feelings is is um, educating, you know, people and then walking away and saying I didn't consider that. Wow, I have to rethink this and relook and re-experiment. But and, and you, you're right, um, critical thinking is just in our educational core. Okay, for lack of a better you know, way to phrase that uh, is a component. We're not, we're never going to do any better, you know, with our, with the young people of today or the next generation if our, if our educational core isn't, hasn't been properly trained, isn't properly trained in critical thinking. And I have no good answers for that. I, I you know, it's a, it's not only a nationwide problem, but a global problem. So, um, I, I, you know, it's, I don't know, a process of educating and re-educating and enforcing standards and some aspects, even cultural dynamics. As I said, I, I saw a lot more of that in the UK than I do in the US, which is a little scary to me personally. But um, I, I, I don't know if anyone else... I'll, I'll just answer real, real quick. My, my concern is that, uh, is that, in my experience, critical thinking is not thought of as, as a... It's not taught in schools. It's, it's something that teachers assume that will sort of magically happen. If you teach them biology, if you teach other things, the assumption seems to be if you just show these, show these things that somehow critical thinking will happen, that's not true at all. And so my, 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 my position is that critical thinking needs to be recognized as a, as a legitimate study field at, at the, that lies at the basis of all these other things. So, so you should, you know, critical thinking is the prism through which you understand biology, through which you understand geology, everything else. And so instead of thinking of critical thinking as sort of an afterthought, like, well, oh, by the way, you know, once you get to college, you can take this critical thinking course. No, that should be in the curriculum throughout. So I think that's, that to me, that's the biggest issue, is that critical thinking is not widely recognized in the, in the educational system as, as a, a core component that should be there. Well, I have a dream that Don, I mean, Dan Loxton's book um, will be printed, combining all the junior skeptic articles that have been printed in Skeptic Magazine into a, a, a curriculum approved study guide <laughs> for elementary school with illustrations and everything. That's my dream. <laughs> and 
vote for candidates that support sound science. Yeah. That, that's the way you can really make a difference right there. Well, we need a science debate. Amen. We need a science debate. Yeah. Well, back into the politics without sounding like a conspiracy theorist, it's easier to lead people if they don't think for themselves. So there's not a lot of, there's not a lot of reason to teach critical thinking. Um, you know, we've done a lot of shows in schools, and the teachers don't think for themselves. How are they going to teach it? You know, and you've got the, the, the people that represent the schools and the, the teachers associations and stuff have a lot of political power in a lot of the states. And so if the teachers don't think for themselves and let them do it for them, you know, they're not going to teach it either. Well, and with that, it's kind of the end of this panel. Um, but yeah, it, it, keep in mind, as much as people in America love to say it over and over again, the people you vote for are your employees. No matter what you say, no right. matter what conspiracy theory crazies always say, no, they're employees of you. You can fire them. So they're not doing something that you can't do. You can get rid of them. And people forget that. Can I make an okay, I'll let you do one more thing. Okay, I need to make an announcement very quickly. If you're going to participate in the parade, I have instructions on where to meet and how to get there. So please see me with the information about where to meet for the parade. And then if you haven't noticed, I have a Dragon Con donation box and the reason we need to do that is our signs are very expensive you know they're about twenty dollars each and i invest my own money hoping that i will get enough donations to pay myself back and to also start the next year's signs uh, if you would like to make a cash donation i can give you a receipt uh, for your tax deduction or just a few dollars would help very much and thank you very much for um, considering that and like I said at the beginning, I knew Margaret would make you do something. <laughs> All right, well, thank you so much for coming to the first thing. 